Good morning to you who are watching by means of live stream. Thank you for joining us for our Sunday School lesson. Uh, we have shared some prayer requests here and know that you have concerns on your heart, maybe personal matters of your own or concerns for others. But as we go to the Lord in prayer, certainly we know God knows all of our needs. And let's just share together as we begin our time. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that you're letting us be a part of. It's a privilege to just be alive. It's a gift to have this day. And we thank you for that and ask you to help us to make the most of it because we know that, that uh, you are the one who guides us. You have a plan and a purpose for our lives, and we want to fulfill that. So help us to truly make the most of our day. You hear and have heard the request of our hearts this morning, the concerns we have for others, maybe even personal matters. Lord, in your own way, work in and through each situation in a manner that will bring honor and glory to you. We're just thankful, Lord, that we have you to lean on and to call on and to know that nothing is impossible for you. There's nothing too great. You're able to do any and everything. We ask that your will be done because we know that's what is best. For you can take even the situations that we see as bad and bring good from it. And if that's the way you see fit to do it, Lord, our prayer is that you're just going to have your way and that your name will be able to be glorified in and through all that we encounter. As we come now to the study of your word, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts through it, that we might be guided by it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we have as our background passage chapters 19 through 24, but we're focusing in on chapter 20 of the book of Exodus. And of course, you who've studied the Bible a long time know that chapter 20 is where we have the Ten Commandments given. And you've studied those probably a lot, but we're going to look at them again because I think there's some interesting things that we need to be reminded about uh, in this passage today as well. Now, we have been traveling with the Israelites out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, into the wilderness. We've been, we were at a month and a half when God provided the manna and the uh, quail that one time. And we're traveling on in this journey with them. Uh, and we're now at the three month mark as they get to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is going to be a special place in their life because that's where the Ten Commandments are going to be given to Moses. And it's also the place where they're going to stay for 11 months, a little over 11 months, really. They're going to camp out there for a, a period of time before going on to uh, the edge of the Promised Land. Of course, when we get there, you'll see they didn't get to go on in. But at least they got over there. But they're going to be 11, a little over 11 months here at Mount Sinai. Uh, as we start, it, well, let me just, it's in the third month. I'm at chapter 19. In the third month from the very day the Israelites left the land of Egypt, they came to the Sinai wilderness. They traveled from Rephidim, came to the Sinai wilderness, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Moses went up the mountain to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's a, a beautiful description to me, how I brought you on eagles' wings. An eagle carries its little ones between the wings, on, right behind the head in that uh, area that, you know, between where the wings are flapping. Uh, when a little eaglet is uh, being taught to fly, the mother pushes it out of the nest, and that little eaglet starts flopping and flapping its wings, trying to learn how to fly, and the mother just swoops down and catches that eaglet right there between her, I'd say between our shoulders, but it's between her wings and then brings her that eaglet back up to the nest and lets it rest a few minutes and then does it again. Mean mama, isn't it? Kicking them out of the nest. But uh, catches them again until they're finally able to fly. But that beautiful picture of, of being able to ride there safely while being carried, and, and that's the description he gives. I carried you on eagle's wings. 
brought you to myself. Now if you will carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples, all, uh, although the whole earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. You're special to me. Though all the earth is mine, you're still special to me. And I have a purpose for you is what he was saying. Now go down and tell the people that. I'm not going to read all of the 19th chapter, but it's interesting. Moses gets his exercise. He's up in the mountain. God says, I want you to go tell the people this. So Moses goes down and tells the people what God said. He goes back up into the mountain. God tells him something else to go tell the people. He goes back down again, tells them, quarter off the mountain. Don't let anybody touch the mountain or come onto the mountain or they will die. So they do that. Finally, he's back up there again for this last time before God gives the, the law. And uh, he says, now I want you to go back down again and remind the people, don't touch this mountain or they're going to die. Moses said, God, we've already quartered it off. Nobody can get close to it. I've already told them what you said. I don't care. Go back and tell them again. <laughs> God didn't want anybody to die. But again, I can just see Moses kind of tired at this point and said, look, I've already told them that. They already know not to come up on this mountain. And uh, will you go tell them anyway? Tell them again. So he does. And then God, I want you to notice something, though. Initially, what we have with the Ten Commandments being given to the, the people is that God speaks it. He will later write it on the tablets of stone. But he's first speaking it, and, and what's happening as he's speaking it it is tremendous, uh, well, look down at verse 16 of chapter 19. On the third day when morning came, there was thunder and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain, and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people in the camp shuddered. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was completely enveloped in smoke because the Lord came down on it in fire. The, its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in the thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain. Then the Lord summoned Moses to the top of the mountain. This is when he goes back up again. And... Uh, and again, he told, this is where he tells him, you go back down and tell the people don't touch the mountain. He says, I've already done that. And uh, he says, well, you go back down and tell them anyway. Uh, verse 24, and the Lord replied to him, go down and bring back with, uh, and, and come back with Aaron. But the priest and the people must not break through or come up to the Lord, or he will break out in an anger against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. So you have this cloud, you have smoke that covers the mountain, you have a, a, a quaking, we'd call it an earthquake today, and you've got a trumpet sounding. In other words, everything that would get your attention and let you know that something monumental is about to take place is happening. The people would never forget that. Do you know the mundane things of life you don't remember? Just the everyday routine. It's those special moments, something that made an impression upon your brain that you will never forget. You never will forget where you were when you heard about the planes flying into the Twin Towers, or at least that first one. You probably saw the second one. I didn't see either of those till later in the news, but uh, that night, because I was in a meeting at uh, Louisiana College. I was on the Board of Trustees, and we were in a board meeting when that happened. But you'll never forget where you were either. You'll never forget other moments in life when that were monumental, uh, that, that made that impression. This would make such an impression that they would never forget God giving them the law. Now, keep in mind, all of the passages last week, well, we've, you'll still see it some on in the future, but m several times in the chapters we had before us last week, it said God did this to test them. In one way or another, it, it mentioned God was testing them. Keep in mind, they have just come out of Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt. You didn't have to worry about law 
or anything else. You did what you were told as a slave. If you broke uh, uh, the word of the slave, you didn't do what the slave said, you got punished. But otherwise, you did what you were told to do. Now they are free. They're out on their own. They are a nation of people. God is going to be their leader. What's going to control them now? You know, you see it every once in a while in our world today where a country will have a coup or something and, and the people will want to break out and have an independent nation. It doesn't last very long these days, does it? Because you've got selfishness on the part of the people and whoever the new leader is that takes over gets a little power and, and it goes to their head and they've got their people around them and they want to rule then and all of a sudden it's back under a dictatorship of a different kind but it's still a dictatorship. What are you going to do? America is truly unique. I mean, you think back to the beginning of our nation and, and the independence that they achieved from England and uh, well, Great Britain. England's a part of Great Britain. Uh, the, the independence they achieved from them and had Washington, the, he, he served as president. They wanted him to continue. If he had been the kind of selfish person that some people are today and taken that over, he would have suddenly become like the king of England. They would have, they would have put him in power. He knew that's not what they wanted, what they had, had striven for and had gained, and he said, I'm going home to Mount Vernon. Y'all got elect somebody else. And so it became that, you know, the most you could serve was two terms. There's been one president that served longer than that, and you remember who that was? Roosevelt, that's right. Served, he was elected for the fourth term. Didn't serve it out completely, but he was elected to a fourth term. There's one other person that's been president who was never elected by the people. You know who that was? Gerald Ford. Spiro Agnew, who was the vice president, resigned. Gerald Ford was appointed to be the vice president then. This was under Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon then resigned, and Gerald Ford became president, having never been elected by the people. That's it. I'm, I'm a history teacher. I forget about that. I need to go back to the other. Anyway, some interesting facts. But our nation has lasted over 200 years now, and, and usually somewhere in that length of time, somebody gets power hungry and wants to take over. And we've had a few times that people wanted to do that kind of thing, but we have continued to exist as a nation. These people are free. God's going to be their leader, but they've got to learn to trust him and to follow him, and that was what last week was all about. He did this to test them. Remember he said, don't get more manna than you're going to need. First, uh, don't try to hold it over to the next day, and they did, and it spoiled and stank. Moses got angry with them. Then he said, on the day before the Sabbath, you gather enough for that day and the next day. It's going to last then. And those that did had something to eat the next day. Those that thought, hey, it's going to be here tomorrow just like it has been, they, they went without that next day. You see, God was doing different things to test them, to see, will you trust me? He had already told them, if you will follow me and do what I say, you will not have come upon you the diseases that came upon the Egyptians. And again, it said just before he made that statement, he did this to test them. Now today it is, will you obey me? I'm going to give these commands that will be uh, the, help you in governing life and society. And, and in the giving of these, this will be the law that you will follow. Trust me, follow my commands, and all will be well with you. So that's where we are. We're chapter 20 then. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. Now, the Jews take that as commandment number one, or that and verse two, I mean two and three as commandment number one. We generally start with verse three as the first commandment. In other words, he, we see that verse two is just saying, look, this is what God is reminding them before he gives them the law. And that verse 3 is the first of the commands, which says, Do not have other gods besides me. Four, do not make an idol for yourself. 
Now, the rest of that on down to the next command, which is verse 7, is simply explaining what he means by don't make an idol. Because he's, the rest of that is, whether in the shape of anything in the heaven above or earth below or the waters under the earth, do not bow and worship to them and do not serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's iniquities to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showering faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. In other words, don't have... These first four commands have to do with our relationship with God. He's our leader. We need to recognize the commands related to God. First, don't have any other God. Well, yeah, don't have any other gods before me or besides me. I like the way this puts it, besides me. The old King James says before me, which means in, if you're not careful, you'll think, well, that means there are other gods. Just don't put them before me. It's really don't have any other God beside me. There are no other gods. Anything else is that which you, as he commands next, don't make any idols that, that would be things that you make, wood, gold, or whatever it might be made from. And you who make that are greater than the item that you've made. How can that be your God? That can't do anything for you. In fact, the prophets would tell them later on those very words. These idols that you have for yourself, they're no gods. They can't do anything for you. But I want you to see something else about this second commandment of don't ha uh, make an idol. That, uh, is that we, we've often looked at that verse that says that uh, I, the Lord, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the father's iniquities to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. We've often talked about the fact that the sins of the fathers will be uh, passed on to the third and fourth generation well what it, it doesn't mean that I'm going to be held responsible for the sins of my grandfather and great grandfather what is that what that saying is I'm going to have to suffer the consequences of the sins of my third and fourth generation before me those consequences are going to be passed along they're going to have to be dealt with by the family from here on the influence of that also will be bad in that it could continue to cause that same problem to be carried on in the family if you're not careful. A lot of times we imitate those of our family that are before us, and if we're not careful, we will do the very things that they did. That's why the sins of the fathers will be paid for by those. But the thing that we often don't look at is the blessing of God. Notice that he says, but showing faithful love, this is verse 6, showing faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commands. I'm going to show faithful love to a thousand generations of those who love me. So when you love God and serve him, you are blessing your family for generations to come. The sins of the fathers are only going to be the third and fourth generation. But the blessings to those who are obedient will, be, ha, will have longer lasting effect than that. To me, that's a beautiful promise from God of the benefits of faithfulness to God on the part of us as a people for the benefit of our families to follow us. How many remember four generations before you? Not many of us do that, do we? And when you stop and think, do you, did you ever know your great-grandparents? Some people did. What about your great-great-grandparents? Probably most drop out at that point. They don't know them unless somebody has looked up the family history and put it in writing so that you can go back and look it up. Then you might be able to know something of that. But we don't think of it you know think remember them but you can be a blessing even when you might be forgotten you can still be a blessing to the generations that will come after you so what a, a promise from god that is and then verse 7 do not misuse the name of the lord your god because the lord will not leave anyone unpunished 
who misuses his name. Now, you probably memorized this. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That was the seventh, the seventh verse there, but the fourth command. Uh, excuse me, the third command of God. What do we mean by misuse the name of God or take his name in vain? Well, so often we've thought of it as meaning don't curse because if we use God's name in a, a manner of cursing, then we have taken his name in vain, haven't we? But we can also use his name, take his name in vain or misuse his name when we take it lightheartedly or use it lighthearted means not seriously. And I've shared with you before, uh, and I remember when I preached a revival at Oak Grove a number of years ago. We had gotten up that morning and was eating breakfast there, and, and lit the radio was on in the home where I was, and a preacher that was doing a morning devotion on their local radio station there. And this particular preacher was just preaching on, and, and you know how some people will say, and, uh, and, and the English teachers try to break you of that in school, such and such and such, and, and, uh, and to say something else. Well, this preacher was saying, praise the Lord. He'd say a phrase, praise the Lord, such and such, praise the Lord, such and such, praise the Lord. And, he, and then he said, and people are dying and going to hell. Praise the Lord. And he kept going. And I said, wait a minute. Did he really mean that? Is God praised and glorified when people are dying and going to hell? No. God's not pleased with that. He doesn't want that. And to me, using the phrase praise the Lord in, as a filler in what you're saying was really taking God's name in vain or using it in a lighthearted way. That's not, he wasn't using God's name in a serious manner. Or he would not have made that statement about people dying and going to hell. Praise the Lord. Uh, <laughs> again, I, it, it hit me strong, and I began to go back and reflect on the commands and say, you know, that's really breaking the command of God. Also, if we live our lives in a way as a Christian, I name the name of Christ with my life. I am, I am a Christian, Christ-like. And if I don't live my life in a manner that's pleasing to him, I'm taking his name in vain. If I'm not showing forth a positive influence for Jesus that would draw people to the Lord in my daily walk, in other words, if I do things that are going to cause people to say, oh, he claims to be a Christian, look what he's doing. You see, that also is... is misusing the name of God. My life itself is a misuse of the, the name of God. So there are more ways than just cursing that you can take the name of God in vain. And then the fourth, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's the command. Then he explains it in the remaining verses. You are to labor six days and do all your work but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work, you, your son, your daughter, your male or female servant, your livestock, or the resident alien who is within your city gates. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. It needs to be a day of rest worship was part of rest and they they the, the balance between work and rest is needed six days you'll labor on the seventh you'll rest I saw a t-shirt the other day that had a slogan on it that I thought was interesting I need another day between Saturday and Sunday <laughs> probably a lot of us think that you know hey I need an extra day in there <laughs> another day to get things wrapped up or done that you felt like you needed to do just doesn't seem like there's enough time anymore to do all the things you want to do but he's saying here there needs to be that balance between work and rest six days God created the the heavens and the earth or the earth and everything that was in them and then on the seventh day he rested but God doesn't need to rest does he Psalm 121 says he neither slumbers nor sleeps. So what was God doing on the seventh day resting after the creation? 
He was doing it for us to teach us something. And then he reminded them in the commands that that's what they should be doing. But also, we need a day of rest. That's why I hated when the blue laws went out. Blue laws said it's only emergency type places or places that had emergency type needs could be open on Sunday. It's been since I've been here that that was killed in the Louisiana legislature, but they also permitted you to have local option elections to reinstate it if you wanted to. And I'll never forget Morris Blumenthal, a Jew who was owner of Fields department store or clothing store went to bat with us to try to get that put on the ballot for people to be able to vote on we knew that you could not have unequal competition in the parish and that it would need to be passed by every municipality as well as the police jury to put it on the ballot and then it would need to pass in all of those entities to be able to to work you couldn't have one entity, hey, we can sell on Sunday and you can't and you're right next door. And that was the way it was going to be written up. We had every entity, Sterlington, Richwood, West Monroe, uh, and the Polish jury had all agreed to put it on the ballot. We went before the Monroe City Council and they would not allow it to be put on the ballot. But even Morris Blumenthal was in favor of it being put on the ballot for people, even though worship for him was on Saturday as a Jew. Our contention was that for clothing and automobiles and all of this kind of stuff, people aren't going to, you know, that's not an emergency. They're not going to have any more money to buy those things on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday as they are on Sunday. It, there's just so much of that kind of money to go around. And that it was going to add to the overhead of these stores because you're having to stay open an extra day, meaning less profit. For the stores also our big contention was it was going to undermine family life for the one day that most families at least could be together was sunday because you had some people nurses and doctors and and other type of emergency things that had to be open on sunday but for the most part most families had a sunday they could be together and it was going to take a lot of people out of homes again out of the families uh, to be at work and help uh, further you know, diminish family life for people. Well, again, as you know, we did not get it passed and the blue laws went, uh, in fact, you had no option if you were in the mall. Mall management said everybody's got to be open on Sunday now. Even Morris Blumenthal's store, their fields was in the mall and they had to be open on Sunday, except for one store. You know which one that was? Chick-fil-A. Even though when Chick-fil-A came into the mall, we had the blue laws. Nobody was open on Sunday. Still in the contract of Chick-fil-A, they will not be open on Sundays. It was something that was thought not really necessary, but it was signed and agreed upon so that when the mall management told Chick-fil-A, you've got to open too on Sundays, they said, no, we don't. It's in our contract that we don't open on Sundays. And they have not had to, and they have not opened on Sundays, uh, even though the blue laws uh, went out after the mall was in, in place. Just interesting things concerning that. There needs to be, but why do we worship on Sunday instead of the Sabbath, which is Saturday? Well, the Sabbath commemorated the creation of, of, of God. The Sunday represents the recreation. Jesus told the uh, the angel told the women, go tell the disciples to meet in the upper room. He's going to meet with them. And Jesus met with the disciples and others in the upper room on that first day of the week, the day of resurrection. The next Sunday, he met with them again. That time, Judas was with them, if you remember. And it became the habit of, re of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, which represents the recreation. We are new creatures in Christ Jesus when we come children of God that that's the reason we worship on Sunday it's a celebration of Easter every time we gather on Sunday it's a reminder of what Jesus did for us and the fact that he did rise from the dead as he promised but it be, has become our day of worship in commemorating the resurrection 
and the recreation as the Sabbath commemorated the creation of God. <coughs> but remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy was the way it was put. Those first four deal with uh, man's relationship with God. Then number five deals with family life. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. What land was that? The promised land, right? That was the land that was promised. He's going to be giving. You notice it's future. The, the land which the Lord your God is giving you. He's already made a promise. He's taking you there now. But if you will honor your father and mother, you'll live long in that land. It's a promise of God for long life in the land that he would, had promised them if you would honor father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Do you notice how these is just a one statement? In the ones related to God, it, it, you know, it, 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 when he said don't have any other, don't make an idol, he explained of anything in the heavens above, the earth beneath, or, the, or in the seas under the earth. He made explanations of those. But on these, it was just simple statements. Don't murder. Don't steal. Don't commit adultery. Don't give false testimony against your neighbor. And then the last one, do not covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant, female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now that one had a little bit of an explanation. It's interesting that between the giving of the uh, commands by God as recorded in Exodus 20 and the reiterating of them in Deuteronomy chapter 5 where you have the Ten Commands again, that one, that last commandment is changed a little. Don't covet your neighbor's wife or his house is the way it is in Deuteronomy. Whereas in Exodus, don't covet the house and then the wife. The status of women had risen already to be greater than the house. In Exodus 20, uh, <coughs> it's don't covet your neighbor's house and then the wife. Now, to covet means you want it. You, you, and, and the reason for don't covet, because it will lead you to the point of stealing many times or doing something else in order to get it. Coveting is a strong desire for it. There's a difference in having a strong desire for something that somebody else owns and being appreciative of that which they have. We ought to be grateful for that which somebody else has been able to get. Be thankful for it. I always tell them, I'm thankful for it as long as you didn't steal from God in order to get it. You know, some people hold out on God that which belongs to him, and then they buy these new cars or whatever it might be, and they bought that with stolen money. Now what God says, if you don't give him what belongs to him, you've stolen it from God. Now that I can't be happy for them for. But if they've been honest with God and their dealings with God and, and God's blessed them to be able to have something, I'm happy for them. We ought to be happy for one another and the things that somebody's able to get that can be a blessing to their life and help them with their life. And that's the reason for coveting. Now, chapters 21, well, let me read the reaction of the people. All the people witnessed the thunder, lightning, sound of the trumpet, and the mountain surrounded by smoke. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. You speak to us and we'll listen, they said to Moses, but don't let God speak to us or we will die. That giving of the Ten Commands, God speaking it to them, I still remember the, the Cecil DeMille's Ten Commandments, and you remember that voice thundering out of the mountain and in the giving of that? Check out that movie sometime if you've never seen it. it. It vividly portrayed it, and that was with the old way of doing graphics. I don't know what they'd do in the newer age of making that uh, movie. But the people fell back from the mountain and said, Moses, let God speak to you, and you tell us we'll do everything he says. They truly wanted to be obedient because they feared God. That's the reason God did it the, manner, the way he did it. He wanted them to realize the mightiness, the majesty of God, and the, he wanted them to have that 
feared, not to be afraid of in the sense of cowering from, but to respect God. And even they did fear God in the sense that they didn't want God speaking to them for fear they would die. Let him speak to you. You tell us. We'll do everything that God has said. But then they didn't, did they? Moses responded to the people, Don't be afraid, for God has come to test you so that you will fear him and will not sin. And the people remained standing at a distance as Moses approached the total darkness where God was. Now, God gave additional laws in. The rest of the passage that's uh, the background for today on up through chapter 24 is fleshing out these Ten Commandments. What I mean by fleshing out is thou shalt not kill or don't kill. Well, what happens if it's premeditated, you planned it versus it was an accident? What do you do if it was an animal that caused the death of an individual? What do you do if, in, in all kinds of situations? So those explain it. If it's premeditated, death comes to that person. Eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If it's an animal that did it, one of your animals that killed somebody, gored them, as it says, and they were with a horn, gored it, gored the individual, and they died, then if that was the first time this has ever happened, then that animal is to be killed and that meat given to the family in which the death happened in their family and there should be restitution made. But if that animal uh, has done this before and nobody did anything about it, then that person's responsible for the death. I'll let you read those verses, but l let me just share this. This is why in our own legal system today, we have first-degree murder, second-degree murder, manslaughter. You have armed robbery versus unarmed robbery. What I'm saying, we have all kinds of laws that deal with the various kinds of situations that might come up. First-degree murder is premeditated. It was planned and carried out. About the only th way you can try to get out of something like that is claim insanity, right? You'll hear one of the first things a lawyer will say, we're claiming insanity. Well, we've got to go through some tests. So is it temporary insanity or is it insanity? It's amazing to me how some people can have temporary insanity. They're saying that about this guy that shot up all those people in Las Vegas last Sunday night. He snapped. Listen, if you have planned for several days and carried ammunition and guns into a room over the course of several days, you don't just snap. That was planned. That was premeditated. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what they're saying, too, in the news. But some of the people are trying to lawyers are saying, oh, he must have snapped. No, that wasn't a snap. That was planned. And, and you know, versus somebody in the heat of the moment getting angry at somebody and killing them, that's second degree can be manslaughter. Now we have vehicular manslaughter. Or vehicular homicide. They don't call it vehicular homicide. If you kill somebody but you did it with a vehicle, you were driving, did you do it because you were impaired and that was illegal? What I'm saying is, you see, when you just say, thou shalt not kill, that's the command. But then how are you going to work it out in the everyday situations of whether it was planned, accident, or something else? And that's why the additional laws were given in those chapters that follow that to explain what to do in those situations. And it, it's covered pretty thoroughly there. And we know that, that laws are needed to help society exist in peace with one another. Now, let me make one last statement, and then I'm going to be through for the day. There are people who look at the Ten Commands and say, well, God restricts you with those, all those thou shalt nots. Can't have any fun if you keep the Ten Commandments. I've heard all kinds of things through the years. Let me tell you this. If you break the commands of God, you actually wind up hurting yourself more, as well as most of the time other people too. 
Keeping the commands was God's way of helping protect us. It was for our benefit and our good. It's not to restrict you in living. It's to help you have the best life. Any one of those commands, if you look at them closely and think about breaking it, you have hurt yourself or others or society as a whole, and chaos can come if everybody does it. The commands are given to benefit us, not to restrict us or not to hinder us in life. It's to help you to have the best life. <clears throat> Anybody who breaks them is going to create difficulty for others and themselves too. So he was trying to help us, not hurt us. Well, we'll pick it up chapter 25 next week and continue to go forward with Exodus. I hope you'll be here as we do it. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And I do trust that as we're going through this study, that we'll understand the importance of being obedient to you, of listening to what you say, and of passing the test that you put us through uh, each day. Because you want to see, will we do what you're, you want us to do? Will we obey you? For if we follow you, our lives will be blessed. If we don't, we're going to get into a lot of trouble and create trouble for others and ourselves as well. So, Father, help us to realize these just weren't for times gone by, but they're just as real for us today. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And those of you who've been watching by means of live stream, thank you for watching. And I ask that you let us know either by texting that 376-3756 or calling the number 343-0181 that you see there on your screen. And it'll be our way of having a record that uh, you're being a part of us today. We like to know those things just to see who all is involved. Thank you again. And thank you for being here today. And I pray that you'll have a great week. And stay with us for worship. That starts in just a little bit. All right.